Hello everyone, I've been noticing a lot of people asking Ben Shapiro lately for his reading list and I thought that I could help. I went ahead and I compiled um, all his recommendations as far as books go. If this is too long and boring for you, I went ahead and posted them in the description box and labeled them one for important and two for not as important. One thing before we get started, I wanted to add the Federalist Papers because I realize after I made this video that he mentioned that at um, his last speech. So the Federalist Papers is one of his main recommendations under list one. Enjoy. Russell writes, Dear Ben, I'm a second year college student have been listening to your show for two months. I hold great respect for your defense of liberty and envy your eloquent way of speaking. I've always held traditional conservative values partially because of my parents, although recently I've become more libertarian. Whenever a professor presents a progressive idea and my classmates not, I feel alone. My question is, how do I become more solid in the ideas of free market capitalism and individual freedom so that when I'm in that situation, I can rebut in a coherent way? I mean, the answer, Russell, is that you just have to read. So if you're going to read books on economics, the, the two kind of basic primers primers are, are Thomas Sowell's Basic Economics and Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. You read those two, you will know more than all of your classmates combined about the, about the basic workings of free markets and economics and the morality of free markets and economics. I'd also look up Thomas Sowell's The Quest for Cosmic Justice, uh, which, is, which is really terrific. So this is, it's a really good book, Black, Rednecks, and White Liberals. The title of the, the piece, the title of the book, is uh, predicated on an essay that he wrote about why black culture, uh, ghetto culture is what he calls it, why ghetto culture uh, is more violent and where the high rates of single motherhood come from. And his theory is basically, it doesn't come from genetics and it doesn't come from Africa. It comes from a white redneck culture that prevailed in the South and was predominant in the South and actually comes from border areas in Britain, from Scotland and Ireland. And the people who inv inhabited the South were very different from the people who inhabited the North. Slaves brought over to the United States grew up not just as slaves, but also grew up in this milieu of, of tribal, almost tribal Highlander stuff. Uh, and, and they took up a lot of those, those cultural totems. And it's a fascinating book, Black, Red, Next, White Liberals by Thomas Sowell. Oh. The justice system, by the way, is not biased against Black people or Hispanic people. Read Barry Latzer's The Rise and Fall of American Crime, uh, and, uh, uh, Violent Crime in America. And you will see there are statistics that he lists backing this up. The actual racism here is that blacks and Hispanics are incapable of avoiding criminal acts resulting in conviction. Criminality is not a proxy for race because race isn't related to criminality. Culture is related to criminality. And some cultures are more prominent among certain people of certain races. Individuals, not melanin levels, commit crimes. But according to Obama's social justice regime, we have to be judged as members of our race rather than as individuals. So if a criminal is black, he's black first and then a criminal. So if you punish the criminal, you're punishing the black guy. That's really, really gross. Things I like. There's a good book by Ed Morrissey called Going Red that's, in, that's out now. I'm in the middle of it. Uh, I want to do a Q&A with, with Ed for, for, our, for our website. Uh, he focuses in on seven different counties in the United States that are sort of swing counties. And what exactly do they want? Instead of focusing on 300 million Americans, most of whom don't vote, he focuses in on, on the swing counties. It's a very interesting book. There's a book by George Gilder, who's a tremendous author, called The Scandal of Money. Uh, I'm in the middle of that one right now, and I will tell you how it is. But all of his other books are excellent. Knowledge and Power is a really good book. Uh, and uh, the Wealth and Poverty is a very good book. George Gilder is a very, very solid thinker. Okay, time. the thing that I like, I'm in the middle of a very good book by Heather McDonald of the Manhattan Institute called The War on Cops. And it is a... It is a very good, we may have a graphic of it, but it's, it's, it's a very good book. Um, and um, it, it basically talks about the Ferguson effect and why it is that the left's attack on law enforcement is actually making people in the inner city less safe and raising crime rates. This is something that deeply disturbs me. I've talked about this at length on the program. I think that's very important for, for people who are conservative to understand why crime rates are rising again, why they fell in the first place. I see a certain libertarian wing of the party that's willing to undermine law enforcement in order to push civil liberties. Listen, I like civil liberties too, but to pretend that imprisoning criminals has no correlation with lower crime rates is just silly. The reality is that crime rates dropped from 94 to recently because there was an increased attention on longer sentencing and more focus on going after, going after lower level criminals. There was a crackdown on crime in the mid nineties and it had impact all the way through until the last few years. And now it's reversing itself. And that's going to have some dire ramifications for people who wish to live in a free and prosperous society. That I like, there's, if, if you ever want to read a, a really good book 
debunking utilitarianism. And one of the one of the great challenges to conservative philosophy uh, is the philosophy of utilitarianism, which suggests the greatest good to the greatest number, essentially. John Stuart Mill is the father of utilitarianism. There's a guy named James Fitzjames Stephen, who was a lawyer in the 1870s in England, and he wrote a book called Liberty, Equality, Fraternity. That is an excellent book. I think you can still get it on Amazon. It may be out of print, but if you can check it out, go check it out. It's really good. Liberty, Equality, Fraternity. The thing that I like today is, idol, is a book basically about the idol worship of the left and how that has come to become such a prominent part of American life. It's a book called The Long March by Roger Kimball. Really, really good book. I've been working my way through it. It's a bit of an old book, about 10 years old. Roger Kimball is uh, somebody with whom I am friendly. And, uh, and this book is quite brilliant. It really traces the rise of the intellectual left and how they, they defeated the liberals in America, how the left took over for the liberals and destroyed leftism and, and liberalism from the inside to create what we see now, an unworkable left that, that really wants to rip away at the roots of what America stands for. A couple of things that I like. I think I've mentioned, people always ask about history books. I think I've mentioned Modern Times by Paul Johnson before, but another great history book is a book by A.J. Langeth. It's spelled L-A-N-G-G-U-T-H, A.J. Langeth. It's called Patriots, The Men Who Started the American Revolution. And it, it tells the history of the American Revolution, it talks about George Washington and Adams and Sam Adams and Brent, Ben Franklin. Sam Adams is probably the greatest book recommendation. A lot of people have read Orwell's 1984. He actually wrote a book that's better. It's called Farewell to Catalonia. It's a nonfiction book and it's a memoir. George Orwell actually went to Spain during the Spanish uh, Civil War between the communists and the fascists. And he fought alongside the communists. And the book is about how he comes to the realization that basically the communists are the fascists, that, that the communists are fascists and the fascists are fascists too. So it's fascists fighting fascists. Uh, and it's, it's a really, it's a short book. It's about 200 pages uh, and it's really powerful and it's really good. I think it's better than 1984, which uh, 1984 is a great book. It's a little bit over long. Farewell to Catalonia is a really, really good book. So you should, you should pick that one up. I started reading a book called The Rise and Fall of Crime in America by Barry Latzer. As I mentioned last week, um, I, I finished the book Nudge by, by Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler over the weekend. Uh, and it's a, a somewhat creepy book. The idea is that the government should basically set your defaults. So if, if you have a, an option between eating a healthy meal and a non-healthy meal at a restaurant, then the restaurant should basically put out just the healthy meal options and hide the non-healthy meal options. Uh, that if you are going to be enrolled in a certain type of social security, the government should encourage you to enroll in one type of social security over another. They call it libertarian paternalism. The idea is the government should enforce you to do things. The problem is they assume a huge, powerful government, and then they say the government that's already huge and powerful should push you toward one option or another. If they're real libertarians, they'd say the government should get out of this completely, and we should just encourage people to be aware of their own cognitive biases, what they call cognitive biases. We all make sort of cognitive mistakes, and those mistakes actually have ramifications for the choices that we make in our lives. And so if we're aware of them, it makes it more obvious for us not to, not to do it. Uh, also, my, on my reading list, I always give you the update on my reading list. Uh, the book Nudge by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein this is an important book because this is one of the founding documents of the Obama administration. Whenever they talk inside the Obama administration about using the power of government to nudge people towards certain behavior, this is what they're talking about. And so I like to read what the left has to say so that we can learn how to combat it and what's there that's of use. So I will give you an update after I have read that book. So I'm, I'm, I always give you my reading list right now. I'm, I'm doing some light reading, a book called The Devils by Dostoevsky. So that's, there's some light reading for you. Okay, so a thing that I like, I'm a big fan of science fiction. There are very few really good science fiction books. Most science fiction books are really quite terrible. Uh, there, there are some fantasy books that are really good. The best fantasy book of all time is actually not Lord of the Rings, uh, it, which is overwritten. The best fantasy book of all time is The Once in Future King by T.H. White. The second half of, of The Once in Future King by T.H. White is absolutely magnificent, so you should take a look at that. I'm reading two books now. One is called The Insanity Offense. I'm, I'm fascinated with the mental health conditions of, of the country, and this book called The Insanity Offense is all about how the, how the, the country, the, the democratic process, our politicians have failed the mentally ill in the country, and that's why you see tons of homeless people on the streets, and that's why you see increasing numbers of mass shootings by people who have mental illness. And, uh, and he talks about how things got this way, the author does. So the book is called The Insanity Offense. And on the fiction side, I just started a book called The Whites, which was uh, a detective crime novel that was recommended to me. Uh, and so I will check it out and let you know if it's any good. Uh, but in terms, of, in terms of science fiction, the best science fiction book probably ever is one they just made into a series on, uh, on sci-fi, which is, which is Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke. Really, really great book. A very thought-provoking book. So finishing up that Nate Silver book I was talking about, good book. 
Uh, there's another book that I'm reading now by a guy named Jonathan Gottschall, who's a professor uh, somewhere in the East, and it's called Professor in the Cage. And it's, it's all about basically why it is that men love watching the fights, like why men like watching boxing. And I found myself interested in this book because my entire life I thought I, I hate boxing. I don't like contact sports. Like it's not, not just that I wouldn't engage in it. I find it brutal and I'm a civilized person. And then as I got older, I realized that I sort of like watching the fights like everybody else. And so I started thinking about why is it that human beings are built this way? And he makes a really compelling case that human beings, particularly men, are built this way. And all of this nonsense you hear about there are no brain differences between men and women. Okay, you really have to be an idiot to believe that there are no differences between men and women. Just but look at their behavior, okay? There's anybody who, the people who act as though the new scientific brain scans are exact enough to, to suggest that all differences between men and women are culturally created. These are people who have never met a man or a woman. And these differences exist across cultures. It's a, it's a pretty good book. I'm about halfway through it. I'll give you the update uh, when I finish. Uh, there's a great book called Tragedy and Comedy by Walter Kerr. It's really good. One of the great questions in, in drama is what's the difference between a tragedy and a comedy? What's the difference between uh, a tragedy and a comedy? Because most because what makes you laugh and what makes you cry are very often very similar things. Walter Kerr's theory in a, in a great book called Tragedy and Comedy is basically that life is both tragedy and comedy. And the reason is because tragedy is Hamlet aiming for the stars, but understanding that he's going to end up like Yorick, right? It's, it's, it's the fact that we are capable of reaching out to God and reaching out to the stars, but that we're always going to fall short, that we're always going to die. Instead of doing something that I like today, I'm going to do just, I want to tell you what's on my reading list right now, because that way maybe we can read these things together. So I just finished a book called The Wisdom of Crowds that's very good. I'm in the middle of Robert Kaplan's book, The Revenge of Geography, and it's very good. It's it, basically, it's his argument about how we have all of these highfalutin ideas about foreign policy going in, human rights, saving people. And we have to understand the constraints of geography, that, that there are realities on the ground that are not just ideological, but that are actual physical geographies on the ground, making it difficult for us to control certain areas of the globe. And our machinery may not be comprehensive enough to, to do all of this without a long-term occupation, as we found out in Afghanistan. Really, really good book called Ghosts of Manila by Mark Cram. Really terrific book about the fights between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, and really traces Ali's entire life uh, in this book. And it really is a, a terrific, terrific book. Not very long. You can get it on Amazon Boxing as well. Here is here is the, the best baseball book, or at least the best-selling baseball book probably ever written. It's a book called Ball Four by Jim Bouton. Um, this book is R-rated. It's totally R-rated, but it's the first of its kind. It was it was a book that was written by Jim Bouton, who, who had he was a fastballer for the, for the New York Yankees, and he blew out his arm and tried to reinvent himself as a knuckleball pitcher. David Foster Wallace is an author who committed suicide, um, but he's a really terrific writer. I'd never read any of his stuff. I was recommended this book, String Theory, David Foster Wallace on tennis. Uh, and he has some essays in there on Roger Federer and Andre Agassi. And it's, it's really a fun bathroom book to read. The writing is really great. David Foster Wallace. On Over the weekend, I read a very depressing but good book called Earth Abides. Uh, this is a sci-fi book. This is basically, there's been some sort of giant biological catastrophe and pretty much all of life on Earth is wiped out, but there's a small community that survives. George R. Stewart, considered one of sort of the great sci-fi novels uh, of all time. This one was written, I believe, in 1949, um, but it didn't date it. It, it reads really, really well. Uh, and it is, in fact, a good book, Earth Abides. It's a little depressing, but guess what? Most post-apocalyptic books tend to be. Alas, Babylon is today's post-apocalyptic literature. Pat Frank, this book is, is you know, kind of a, a classic of the genre. Uh, nuclear war hits. How do people survive afterward? Uh, it's, uh, it's been made into a movie, I think. I don't think the movie's particularly good, but the, the book is very good. Uh, I read it several years ago, and I just remember enjoying it all the, as much as you can enjoy a, a book about the end of the world. So, Alas, Babylon, Pat Frank. Check it out at Amazon.com. Okay. There's a fantastic book. Everybody should know this book. They made a good movie out of it with uh, Robert Wagner uh, called In Cold Blood. Uh, In Cold Blood is it's, it's a classic of the genre. It really is kind of the first true crime genre, genre story. It's kind of quasi-novelesque. Uh, it's Truman Capote's best book. It's, it's a really, really good book. They made, so there's, this is a, a fiction book by James Missioner called The Source, uh, and it's, it's a really fantastic book. It's, 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 it's all about, it starts off, it's, it's sort of a pastiche. It starts off with somebody digging at a tell, when they say Tel Aviv, what they mean is it's a dig. It's an archaeological site. Um, and so he's digging at a tell, uh, and it's sort of him uncovering the history of Israel through archaeology. And it's, it's basically a bunch of short stories, but a bunch of them are really, really compelling and interesting. Uh, so the book is The Source by James Missioner. Uh, it's a long read, but it's an easy read. 
things I like. We're doing sort of Israel-related things today that I like. The book Exodus by Leon Uris. This is a really terrific book. Leon Uris is a really, really good author. And my favorite book of his is a, is a book called uh, Mila 18, uh, which is a, a book about uh, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. That's really good. This book is also very famous. They made a not very good movie of it with Paul Newman. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, Leon Uris is a really good writer, and, and this book is sort of the, the history of the founding of Israel. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a really good, you know, very justly famous book. I mean, over a million copies have been sold, so uh, it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty great book. And for things I like and then some things I hate. So things I like, we've been doing sort of Israel edition. So I want to give some, some biblical criticism, uh, a biblical criticism book that I think is really terrific. Rabbi David Foreman is the author of this one. It's called The Beast That Crouches at the Door. Um, and it's a really good biblical analysis of Adam and Eve and what, what the Bible is talking about in Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. A really, really fascinating book. You can get it on Amazon.com. Rabbi Foreman runs, a, runs an organization called Aleph Beta that uh, allows people to, to listen to classes online. Uh, and this book is really terrific. It has a really fascinating take on Adam and Eve that at some point in the future, when we have more time, I'll have to explain because it really is, is quite good. So I highly recommend this book. He also wrote a book about Exodus that's really, really good. Um, so his, I, I really enjoy a, a lot of his writing. Oh, this week and things that I like. People always ask me, what's the best book that I could get? It gives me background of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, and, uh, and the best book that you can get is very user-friendly. It's one called Myths and Facts. Uh, a Guide to the Arab-Israeli Conflict by Mitchell Bard. What's great about this book is that it breaks everything down, like all the different myths, into about half a page. And so you'll, need, you'll, you'll know everything you need to know if you pick this up from Amazon.com. It's a very good, quick reference guide. Uh, the, today's things I like, there's this book that's now at the top of the New York Times bestseller charts called The Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. Uh, and, it's, and it's really, really a good book. It's a, it's a very well-written book. It's about a guy who grew up uh, in Middletown, Ohio, uh, and he comes from Kentucky originally, and it's sort of about hillbilly culture, and he ended up going to Yale Law School, so it's about how he sort of went from being in this hillbilly household where his, his dad ran out on him, and his mom ran through a series of men, and his mom was a, was a drug addict and an alcoholic and, and had mental illness, and his grandparents were taking care of him, and this really kind of terrible culture, how he got out of it. And what's really fascinating is that the whole thing is a critique of individual decisions. What he says is the way to escape kind of the hillbilly culture is to just not engage in bad decision making. There are good things about the hillbilly culture, like familial loyalty, but there are bad things too. And the government can't solve these bad things. Now, one of the problems that I had with hillbilly elegy is not the message. The message I think is totally right. I think that there's a whole group of people, and it's across America, crosses racial boundaries, isn't just true for what he calls the hillbilly culture. It's true virtually everywhere in America. There are people who believe that all of the problems in their life are due to some outside force. We're seeing that election happen right now. Hillary says the outside force is evil American racism, and Trump says the outside force is China, right? This is, this is the routine. Somebody outside you is hurting you. J.D. Vance says, no, really, I grew up in this. The people who are hurting you are you. If you make good decisions, there are enough resources for you to do well. The only problem I have here is that there's this idea that if Trump says that to the black community, or if I say that to the black community or the white community, or if somebody black says that to a white guy who's growing up in Middletown, Ohio, that it has less relevance than if somebody from your own culture says it. This identity politics, I must have lived the experience in order to speak a basic truth. This is what I object to. And I, J.D. Vance isn't doing that by any stretch of the imagination, but the reason the book's getting so much attention is because it's someone from inside the culture saying the culture has problems. Well, something is either true or it's not. Single motherhood is more damaging to children than being married and staying with the person you're married to while you have kids. End of story. There are always exceptions, but as a general rule, that is true. And that's true regardless of your race, and it's true regardless of whether you've had the experience. We need to read these books and take away the message, but we don't need to take away the idea that you must be an outgrowth of the bad culture in order to speak about bad culture. I don't have to be a member of, an, uh, of Middletown, Ohio culture to understand that it is very bad to get involved in drugs and alcohol and abandon your children. Things I like. Uh, so somebody last week in the mailbag asked me, who are the smartest people in fiction? So I'm not sure if I've, have I, I'm not sure if I've done this book before on the show. If I haven't, I should have. It's the best, it's the best action novel ever written by a long shot. And anybody who's ever written action novels will tell you. The book is The Day of the Jackal by Frederick Forsyth. It is a fantastic, fantastic book. The movie version with James Fox is not bad. The, the book is just spectacular. I mean, it is, it is again, the best action novel you will ever read. For this one. He, he recommended the book the, the Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, about two-thirds of the way through that, and it is very enjoyable. It is a good book.